put it off long enough. Enough is enough. I've got to predict the title race once and for all and one last final time. And here it is. It's blurred. You, you think I was actually going to show you it? Well, we're actually going to reveal, of course, who will win the Premier League title race. I don't even know why I'm holding it up. It's blurred. I've really thought about this one, guys, and I needed to wait until after the Man City Arsenal game because I thought it was a huge, huge game. It was a boring one, <laughs> but it was huge nonetheless. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to give you a proper understanding of where the Premier League title is actually heading this season, starting off with fixtures. Who plays first? Who plays last? It's something that is really, really important. Every Liverpool fan will tell you that. They always go to that. And most of us already have a keen eye on fixtures, but what a lot of people overlook is the actual timings of the games. For example, playing first could give teams an advantage to set the tone whilst I don't know, putting pressure on the other title contenders to keep up the pace. And the last week of April is absolutely crucial in all of this. Because you can go through the fixtures, that's all well and good, but what about the time frames between those fixtures and the European ones? Think! But this is the JLA channel. Don't think we've forgotten about those European fixtures because this gives an added level of nuance to the title race, especially with what we're about to touch on next. If Liverpool progress to the Europa League semi-finals, they will have the first leg followed by Tottenham at home, then the second leg followed by Aston Villa away. If Arsenal progress to the Champions League semi-finals, they will play Tottenham away on the Sunday, then the semi-final first leg in midweek. And of course, they could play Man City in that game and after the second leg, they would then play Manchester United away. Wow. <laughs> Woof. Am I right? Wha oh, 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 oh. Don't know what. I'm... Yeah. And due to Man City playing in the FA Cup semi-final, they will have a game in hand over Liverpool and Arsenal. But of course, that will be a congested last few game weeks as well for them, which is where I think those games will, of course, be played. So the fixtures aren't as cut as dry as you may think. And whilst these three teams will be favourites for every Premier League game that they play, they have an added level of difficulty due to their European ambitions. And I've tried to keep that in mind when I've gone through the fixtures and thought about who could win, when they could win, or when they might drop points as well. But navigating a tough fixture list is always burdened, caveated or nuanced by one haunting factor that Premier League managers are terrified of, and it's never been more true than it is right now. And of course, what we're talking about here is, yes, injuries. Now let's start with Manchester City, a team that have actually been injury-free for the last eight or so game weeks, but now could be impacted at the worst possible time with these injuries that we've picked out. You've got Edison, you know, having your first choice goalkeeper, but injured is never good. Liverpool fans will attest to this, of course. And whilst your second choice can often do a job, we saw that in the Man City Arsenal game, or take a solid, I guess, although he wasn't troubled too much, but more so on the ball. It's just not the same. It's never the same as having your first choice but a goalkeeper between the sticks and in particular someone like Edison and in terms of communication or just even non-verbal communication because Edison has been there for so long and of course match sharpness or match experience as well match calmness let's chuck that in there when it comes to goalkeepers now this is probably Pep's nightmare one of the reasons Manchester City won a treble last season was the duality of John Stone's role, both in midfield and defence. And there's not a single player like him in the Manchester City squad. Akanji will give it a go. He's very versatile. But it, again, he's not John Stones. And furthermore, I don't think there's a player like him in the league. So not having him takes away so much from Manchester City's midfield and defence. And the worst thing at the time of recording is that there is not a return date as of yet. But to round off the hat trick of the worst possible Manchester City injuries, certainly in defence, I think, we've got Carl Walker. Again, there isn't really a similar player in the squad to Walker, and we're also forgetting he often captains the side, and that in itself is a big miss, even if it is just for a few games. And especially when it comes to defensive transition, you know, in terms of beating the press, a lot of teams will go direct, and he is someone that can safeguard the team. That's, that's one of his best assets. Liverpool's injury list is a lot longer than Manchester City's and in theory should impact them equally as hard, if not more. It's a long list, so we'll rattle through it as quickly as we can. We've got Bacetic, who's end of April, Alisson, Trent, Jota, Thiago, no return date there. Jones, no return date there. Robertson, same again. Matip out for the season. But whilst this injury list seems long, there's one factor that I think that we're overlooking. And it's the big hitters could all be back for the crucial fixture against West Ham on the 27th of April. Because as previously discussed, this is the perfect chance to pile on the pressure on Man City and Arsenal with big games for both of them on the Sunday against Forest and I think Tottenham Hotspur, I do believe. It's also Jimbo's birthday. Feel free to send me something. You're not going to, are you? Hit the like button.
Arsenal, on the other hand, can count themselves lucky. They haven't got an, any long-term injuries at the moment. I'll touch wood for you. And to add to that, they're going to get Jiren Timber back any day now, which obviously isn't a bad thing. Now, this table that you see before the, it shows the stats from the last 10 games, but offers an insight that could, I think, perhaps predict when these teams will hit their apex. But... Away from that, there's another interesting stat that offers insight into which teams may be able to keep up the pace for the final sprint of matches. In the second column, it shows us how many starting players the teams have used. I want to look at Arsenal's first because they've used the least with only 17. It shows that they've got a core group of players that Arteta trusts and the starting 11 is fairly continuous. But one thing that could be a bit of a, well, a tiny problem if we look a little bit deeper is that in the fifth column we find this. The average minutes played for Arsenal starting players. And the minutes played by subs is also lower for Arsenal than both other teams at 21 minutes on average. So Arsenal may be running the risk of wearing themselves a little bit thin if we look at it from that perspective. Man City also have an interesting stat behind them. The stat is that 2.7 substitutions made on average over the last 10 games and only West Ham have averaged less in the whole league. Now we know that Pep doesn't make many substitutes but with the squad he has combined with the volume of fixtures especially if they go deep in the Champions League it doesn't sit great with me if I'm honest especially when Liverpool and Arsenal are making 4.4 on average. This may be down to a kind of different philosophy on this where Guardiola will literally just swap out the starting 11s, but still, I think it's a fair concern. Liverpool don't really have a standout stat in here, and they sit on the baseline for most of the stats that we've mentioned. So who are the players that will make the difference if their team is to go and win the Premier League title? We're going to call these not match winners, but title winners, and we're going to utilise the statistical wizardry that is Stathead to provide us with the answers. Stathead allows its users to search through the FB Ref database and create tables and leaderboards that offer extra insight into almost any stat that you can think of. There is a link in the description, and you can get yourself 20% off an annual subscription if you use your boy's code. That code is JLA20. It is such a powerful tool to use, so use that code JLA20, and I promise you won't regret it. It will take your content or your journalism or your knowledge to the next level. So those title winners, let's start off with Manchester City. And when we think of the words Manchester City and goals, I think your mind's going to go immediately to someone like Haaland, of course, or De Bruyne, or maybe even Phil Foden. But when I set these specific parameters into Stathead, it gave me a completely different answer and then gave me Manchester City's key man in attack. Here we have the table that looks at all the goal creating actions from every Premier League player this season. Unsurprisingly, you've got Ollie Watkins, who's up there, as is Anthony Gordon as well. But the player sitting in third place shocked me. It did. It was Rodri. Rodri's made 17 goal creating actions this season and the breakdown is unreal. 12 of these have come from open play, but a further two have come from take-ons made by Rodri, which have led to goals. He's put in numerous and varying actions that have led to goals this season and is an all-round threat. And he has the knack of doing it in the biggest matches, of course, as well. So he goes in as Manchester City's title winner. He has to. And he's a 100-touch man, isn't he? Next up, Arsenal. Now, Arsenal's free-scoring nature of late has been down to one thing, chance volume. But not just chance volume, but quality as well. Combine these two variables together in the correct way, and the goals are almost guaranteed, of course, for any team. And that's why one player's contribution this season could go down in history if Arsenal do take home the title. Now, the player we've selected, with that in mind, utilising the wonderful world of Stathead FB Ref is, of course, Martin Odegaard. He has the second most shot creating actions in the whole league this season with 154 created, but it's from open play where it truly becomes so, so impressive with 126 of these coming from open play, which is the most open play shot creating actions created by any player this season. Martin Odegaard's chance creation will be a big part of the Arsenal's title charge. That's all I'm trying to say. Last but not least, big seasons require big players. They require uh, players that you can rely on in the big moments. And that's exactly what this player has been to Liverpool since he joined them. And none more so than this season, being dependable week in, week out, whilst also putting in 9 out of 10 performances on a regular basis is something almost unquantifiable in its importance, especially for a team like Liverpool, who just bloody go for it, don't they? And in a team with a lot of quality, attacking output in particular, you may think that we should go down that road of it being an attacker, but I don't see it like that. This player has won the second most, shall I show you, the second most aerial duels in the league this season with 113 
is Virgil van Dijk. He's only lost 21 aerial duels, and with an 84% success rate, there isn't an outfielder that uh, played more meaningful minutes with a better success rate. And remember, aerial duels don't just cover defensive actions. They also come in handy at set pieces, and often when you need them the most, Virgil van Dijk is that player for Liverpool. So enough's enough. Let's go through the games that I've got here. And for each team, I think they will go through difficult periods where they might draw some games. And I actually only have one defeat for all three between now and the end of the season. Will that be right? I'd be amazed if it is. But I'm just going on each set of games and how impressive each team has been. I think the European fixtures is a massive problem and you just don't know what's going to happen um, in any of these games. I've done a whole video talking about the fixture list and who's got the hardest fixture list. And again, I think that's important, but it's not everything. It's not everything. I think there's something eating away at me. And what's amazing, actually, when I've gone through these fixtures, every single team I have here wins seven of their remaining games. But one team, two teams actually get 23 points and one team gets 22 points. And it's going to be go it's going to go right to the wire. I see all three of them winning their last game of the season as well. But who will win it? In my opinion, I think Manchester City will finish third. I think that's such a dangerous thing for me to say, especially when you've got, you know, solid platform and you're supposed to generally be sensible in the things that you're saying. But something is pulling at me. And I don't know if it's just because, you know, a couple of games against Liverpool and Arsenal that I'm kind of, you know, it's, it's creating doubt in me. But I was so certain they would win it. But I thought they would be clear, it would be clear by this point. And I thought they would be better defensively. And from an offensive point of view, I think teams are finding it a touch easier to break them down. I don't think Kevin De Bruyne is looking his usual self. Haaland's not looking his usual self. And something, you know, the injuries in there as well. Big games against, you know, Real Madrid, of course, coming up. And who knows what after that could be. Obviously, Arsenal in that as well. But I think Man City will win seven games. I think it'll be a difficult cluster. I think they will lose to Brighton. I've got them down here. I think they'll come up to that game after a lot of games and I think they'll come up a little bit short against the Brighton team that'll just kind of have a go at them I actually think they'll draw one of the games between Wolves Forest and Fulham or sorry Forest Wolves and Fulham and that doesn't look like a difficult cluster but if you look at the videos on the channel this year look at Wolves who were able to beat them at the start of the season look at Chelsea who got some joy against them and a lot of teams have got joy against Man City it's been bypassing the press and having sort of a, a striker up top who can hurt the opposition or players who can drive with the ball. Wolves have the blueprint from previously. They could utilise that and could do well. Fulham could just have a, a great day. Who knows? They might get a draw there. I wouldn't be surprised if Man City, of course, won that one anyway. And Forrest and someone like Chris Wood or Awani and maybe battling for their lives when it comes to relegations at home could pull off a surprise against Man City as well. And then you've got West Ham in that final game of the season. I have them winning seven. I have them losing one. And I have them drawing one. That leaves them with 86 points at the end of the season, according to me. 22 points in this run of games. So then it goes down to Liverpool and Arsenal. I've got both of them winning seven games between now and the end of the season. I have both teams not losing a single fixture. I have both teams going through some sticky patches along the way. The sticky patch for Liverpool, I think, will be the Fulham, Everton and West Ham games. You've got to play on the 21st, 24th and 27th. I think within that, there will be a draw. I think the games before that, they'll play Man United away. I believe they'll win that one. That's what I've got down here. Sheffield United, I expect them to win that. Crystal Palace as well. And then you go to those final games as well. I've got a couple of draws in here for Liverpool. For Arsenal... I've just been so impressed by their mentality this year. I think they've almost bounced so much from one way to the other way. And I think they'll finish strong. I really, really do. I think I am concerned about them running out of gas. And I wonder if going out of the Champions League, although I'm not sure that will happen, I think that wouldn't be the worst thing for them. Um, because it's obviously such a tough run all the way to the final. You're going to have to play Man City or Real Madrid in that semi-final if you can get past Bayern. But I think they'll continue to be strong. I think they'll, they'll continue to win games. Obviously, draws will arrive. And I think their difficult cluster will be the Wolves, Chelsea and Tottenham games in particular. On the 20th, you've got Wolves away. On the 23rd, you've got Chelsea at home, which Chelsea seem to always lift their performances for games against the big sides. And I think that'll be a tricky one as well. And you, in between that, of course, you could have a Champions League semi-final as well. And then, of course, Tottenham <laughs> as well. I think they'll beat Tottenham. 
I know Tottenham fans will hate me saying that. And I think they'll win seven games. And I think they'll draw three as well. And therefore, I have Liverpool and Arsenal both finishing with 23 points. And therefore, the winners of the Premier League, in my opinion, this year will be Liverpool with 90 points. <laughs>